Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 IIE Awards. Uh, my name is Toby Willison, and I am really pleased to uh, be introducing uh, this year's uh, event. This is uh, the culmination of a, uh, a week of activity, uh, a week of events. Uh, can someone move the slide on, please? And I think this afternoon is going to be a fantastic hour or so. So my name's Toby Willison. I'm Executive Director uh, at the Environment Agency. And I'm also, it's my privilege to be Chair of PECT. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, lineup this afternoon. Uh, John Grant, who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, uh, April is going to lead us through the awards. Um, we've got the brilliant Freddie Holt as our uh, as our youth speaker, uh, and then April is going to uh, uh, announce the overall achievement awards. Um, so I think this is going to be a brilliant, brilliant afternoon. Next slide, please. Now it won't have escaped any of your. Uh, uh, any of your knowledge that you know this has been an exceptional exceptional year i think what the pandemic has shown us is that uh actually we live in an extremely fragile uh system whether that's a social system a biological system uh, an environmental system uh, a health system uh, a community system uh, and we all have a massive part to play in, in ensuring that that is sustainable uh, for future generations. Next slide, please. Now, I would say this, uh, and I think, but I think we would all say this, uh, the, the climate emergency and the associated ecological emergency uh, is, to my mind, the biggest challenge that this planet faces. Now, when I look at uh, responsible business, I see a huge amount of activity that is going on uh, to limit and mitigate uh, the impacts of our uh, of our cl changing climate. Now, we all have a have a role to play. Now, whether that's a community, whether that's as individuals, or whether that uh, is as uh, uh, is as business, uh, an IIE has an important role to play you know, with all of you uh, in uh, limiting the impact of uh, climate. So, so that we ensure that we are handing on to future generations uh, a, a sustainable ecosystem uh, where we can all continue to thrive. Uh, next slide, please. It is my Great, great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, John Grant as our keynote, uh, our keynote speaker today. Uh, John is not just uh, an award-winning author. Uh, John is a, a, a strategist, an influencer, uh, and an activist. Um, personally, I haven't heard John speak, but I've uh, uh, I've spoken to people who have, and they have all said, you know, what an inspiring uh, individual, what a powerful individual John is. So I am really, really looking forward to the uh, the next twenty minutes or so. John, over to you. Thank you very much. Hopefully this is working. I seem to be unmuted. And I'm waiting to get control of the slides. There we go. We're in business. Uh, what a build up. I hope I live up to that. Thank you for the kind words. Um, so I've been looking at this. I am by background somebody in the 90s. I was involved in a creative agency. We were quite interested in this kind of issue back then. We had some clients like Anita Roddick, who prodded us to uh, really up our game on sustainability. From the 2000s, a lot of my clients, I've got a very unusual client base because they range in size from companies with 150,000 employees, like IKEA would be an example of that, who I've worked with for a great many years, uh, to companies with three people or two people. Uh, the company I was uh, working with yesterday has about 30 people. There was small uh, manufacturing and organic skincare. So I've really seen this from various um, 
sizes and from about 2000 a lot of companies of those different sizes were getting very engaged with this issue and by 2007 we were all getting very worried about a topic called greenwash um, because we'd seen some prominent examples and it was also a very confusing issue but there was a lot of interest back then and I produced a book then and spoke at many events just like this one and it seemed like we were in one of those times again the last uh, two three years there's been a huge amount happening and um, very handily I've, I've summarized quite a bit of it on the front of this book cover from 2020 um, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about why I think we're at a real tipping point in the way that business is engaging with all of these issues um, some examples of companies that I think are really driving things forward and doing things in a new way and then I'm going to give some really specific pointers and I've got in mind that there may be people in the audience from from huge companies and also small companies and from products and services and so forth so I've tried to put in something for everybody but there are five just very general pointers that I find useful in my work every day in this whole area that I call green marketing or now greener marketing so I think the biggest shift we've seen over that time and the tipping point that we're going through at the moment is moving from an idea of sustainability, which um, was actually my I, my client IKEA uh, that summarized this as being not bad. And traditionally, what you've tried to do if you're a large furniture giant is uh, make sure that you've got nothing um, harmful in the coatings on your shelves, make sure your forestry is responsible, make sure that all your factories have fire extinguishers and don't em employ children, but you're basically trying to do as little harm as possible whilst pursuing your core business. We're increasingly seeing uh, businesses, including um, IKEA, defining themselves as net good. So IKEA's 2020 sustainability report um, talks about being net positive for people and planets. And that's really where it's at now. Um, I'm sure many of you are thinking about this. And in the, you know, not to uh, glide over, I think every presentation should start with uh, the climate emergency and just reminding ourselves that we're in a house that's on fire and that's been uncomfortably apparent during uh, the last month, September, the uh, hottest ever September on record where we saw massive floods in uh, France, we saw fires in California, friends of mine from California were sending me pictures of the orange sky and saying they couldn't go out but couldn't it, because it was quite hard to breathe outside. Um, and you, you'll be aware that 2019, before this extraordinary year happened, 2019 was also an extraordinary year in which um, there were over 2000 cities had uh, climate strikes and street protests on climate. And there was a wave of other protests sweeping up the world. So there's a real mood of change and business is, is very far from uh, ignoring that as we'll come on to. What's really happened? I mean. Unfortunately, slightly unfortunately, after about 2005, 2006, interest ebbed away. I mean, the first thing that happened was this massive financial crisis. And I think we've got to gird ourselves and learn the lessons from that. And people really, the public, uh, some companies, uh, some governments, let this issue ebb away. So what you can see in the top left of this uh, slide is you can see that the proportion of global publics concerned about this issue fell from about 82% to down near 60%, but it's really increased right back up. It's now at 85%. But the real shift that I saw in the data when I was looking at this for my uh, current book is that the numbers of people who say, this is affecting me personally, or as the survey says here, this is affecting my community, that has doubled. So for instance, if you live within 60 miles of a coast in America, you're very likely to say uh, that climate change is affecting me personally. It's not some dis distant geography lesson, scientific issue, it's here and now. And as you can see from the blaze in California, if you lived in Orleans or New York you've, or, or Florida with the hurricanes, you've experienced the most incredible and, and terrifying biblical um, events and weather events. So it, it really doesn't seem like a distant reality. And when you look at global surveys as well, you can see that some countries which are notionally on the front line, one that springs to mind is the Philippines, uh, there are really, really high levels of engagement and concern about climate change. And the other thing that's hurtled up the agenda as it should is species extinction. I, I say to people, there's a reason it's called Extinction Rebellion. Uh, people are hugely mobilized um, by the news uh, covered in this documentary that we could be about to lose a million species from the planet permanently by um, habitat loss and other things that are driving the loss of biodiversity. So uh, this is also a hugely concerning issue. And again, it in impacts every company who sources anything like palm oil 
or wood or so forth because uh, you're actively involved potentially in deforestation. And many of the top companies in the world uh, set targets in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goal to be deforestation free by 2020. But the great majority of them, according to Forest Facts, didn't make those targets and they're recommitting and really trying to see what they can do about this. Um, so, as I said, we're at a tipping point. All of this was going on, but I think what's uh, really encouraging is the way that business is responding and, and really seriously shifting gear and moving, as I said at the start, from, from being not bad and taking the edge off things to being net good. So here's one example, uh, a lovely company called Brewdog, who make uh, very pleasant tasting beer. Um, and this is one of the founders writing on their blog. He says, it hit us like a 400 volt shock in a copper bathtub, the blindingly stark realization that we were not doing anything like enough. And in fact, we were massively contributing to the existential problem that our planet and our species are currently facing. An equally stark realization followed soon thereafter, summarized by this phrase, let's ensure we have a planet to brew beer on. So I cover um, brands and companies that are doing stuff and, um, and you know, of interest to my other connections on LinkedIn. And I have to say this year, there's been something almost every day from Brewdog. And, and on this issue also really interesting, uh, their, their post today was a uh, response to the lockdown of pubs in Scotland. They've also been really active in communities, supporting people through lockdown and the kinds of things they've been doing. So the substantial things they've been doing, and many of you who are up for award, rewards will know how detailed and complex it is to look at your own operations and work out both where you can make cuts, where you can compensate. So they bought a huge peatland bog in uh, Scotland where they're planting trees and also clever ways of in bringing the circular economy into your business. So they're looking at ways that they can reuse waste and heat within the brewing process to give them onward use and, and therefore reduce their net footprint. And they're um, basically giving themselves 24 months to get to net zero. All of us have got until 2050, but the Ford companies are trying to push at least for, for zero net carbon emissions by 2030. And then they've also, which I think is a sign of the times, done a lot of stuff that us, you know, humble consumers can, can see and touch and get involved in. Uh, they're doing things like they're giving equity stakes, so shares in their company for anybody who recycles 50 cans or more. They're taking those cans and turning them directly into brew dog cans. And they say in, in the small print here, don't be surprised if your beer comes in the Coke can. And they're doing things like uh, encouraging people to brew their own beer at home and, and opening up all of their recipes, a tomorrow fund and, and so on and so on. So they're doing a lot and they, they do more and more every day. And you can see that they've shifted to being a really engaged. This is what I mean about being a net good company. And on a broader, and these are mostly corporate members, um, there is a thing well worth checking out, by the way, if you're looking for inspiration, the We, Me, we Mean Business Coalition, which has set out a series of actions that uh, particularly large companies can take. And they've got over 1,300 companies engaged who've made 1,700 commitments so far to bold action. And those uh, commitments could include uh, science-based targets, uh, progress to net zero. They could also include action on renewable energy, electric vehicles, all sorts of things. There's masses happening and, and it, it really looks like a lot of businesses have galvanized. Um, and we've also seen in the year that we've been having the most encouraging thing I've seen, because I have to say it wasn't entirely the case in 2008 and 2009, uh, during the financial crisis is that the people who are committed to this are renewing their commitments to us and saying we need to build back better, we need a green recovery and uh, 180 European politicians, business leaders, including uh, giants like H&M, Ikea, Nestle, L'Oreal, you know, the, the big businesses of Europe signed this. There were 60 different companies from financial services that signed this eventually and uh, the Green Recovery Alliance commitment, again, well worth checking out. So, and we're seeing more and more companies committing to um, net zero and beyond. So net zero means without um, offsets, uh, strictly getting your operation to net zero, which is a bit of an Indian rope trick, but it is also a huge call uh, for innovation. And many companies have committed to that by, uh, by different dates. Microsoft on the right have not only com committed to be carbon negative by 2030, but have committed to remove all of their historical emissions. And they've also put a huge fund for climate. And many members of Pla uh, Plan B, like very lovely association of um, companies committed to the triple bottom line uh, are committing to net zero by 2030. Starbucks, it's not just carbon. So uh, 
you know, many uh, companies with supply chain need to look at other things like Starbucks is also looking at waste and water and is committing on each of those issues to have a resource positive, so net good future. Um, and in that shift, that sort of tipping point, uh, a number of us have started to struggle with the word sustainable, which sounds a little bit unambitious and steady state. So there's a great quote here actually happens to be from a quite ecologically minded fashion company. The word sustainable is like a dinosaur now. What are we trying to sustain? The fires, the tornadoes, the mass extinction. We don't need to be sustainable. We need to be regenerative. So I think in my own little bubble or echo chamber, regenerative is well on track to be the word of the year. And we're seeing, I'd seen, I've been tracking companies like Dr. Bronner's and Patagonia who are very forward in, in ecologically uh, based uh, businesses uh, have been talking about regenerative agriculture and so forth for five or so years. And both of them have uh, got behind a scheme uh, to certify regenerative organic products. But now we're seeing the likes of Danone, Unilever, Walmart. Uh, Walmart sets its goal to be a re regenerative company. These are all really companies that are committing to be net good. So there you go, there's the tipping point. Now, how do you actually work with this? How do you drive forward your sustainability and bring it into your marketing. And I've got one central piece of advice and then some sort of tactical pointers that may be food for thought or inspiration. Next time you have an away day or a brainstorming, have a look at a few of those. So my key piece of advice, and I think this is true of business strategy in general, is, is just know your numbers, look at the data and know your impact. So I'll give you an example for one of my projects that happened to be with a mobile phone manufacturer. I think one of their agencies had come forward with the very nice sounding uh, suggestion that they should incentivize their consumers and perhaps do a partnership with an energy company to only charge their phone re with renewable energy. Whereas currently, you know, about half the energy in the UK um, in some recent months is renewable. So to go, you know, sign up with Ecotricity, for instance, one of the sponsors and only charge. And it's a lovely thing to do. And I wouldn't uh, criticize that. But if you look at the actual data about mobile phones and you find that about 97 percent of a mobile phone uh 95 percent i guess would be the average looking at these two figures comes from mining manufacturing transport and basically making your phone and only about five percent is in use so uh, without going through the details of the, of the calculation um only charging your phone through its two-year lifetime with renewable energy would save you about uh 25 megajoules keeping it in use for an extra year because of the weight that goes into embodied energy would say 500 megajoules. So you can see that's a much more meaningful thing. And actually, if people only kept their phone for another month, uh, you're really making a significant dent. And the same, a similar calculation applies to things like cars, you know, keep them in use for longer. And so if you're trying to drive the sustainability with consumers, the second one would be a great way to go. And that's something that I suggested some years ago to O2 when I was working with them. Uh, and they really liked the idea from a business case point of view as well. Uh, it was quite an interesting model for them. Here's another example, um, Starbucks. I think a lot of the focus, when you think about big companies like Starbucks, you think, oh, look at all that waste, all those paper cups, they've got coffee, they've got you know a global chain of heated stores. All of those impacts are dwarfed by their one big impact, which is dairy. It's the, it's the big block on the uh, top left of that chart in the bottom of this one. 21% of their impact is dairy. Um, and that's because of the excessive uh, carbon footprint of uh, dairy farming and uh, milk production. And also, you know, the same thing would apply to a, a fast food chain with uh, beef products. So what Starbucks have done, I think what you do have to do is, first of all, find out what your impact is. And secondly, find a really creative way to engage. So Starbucks have been pushing actually almond and soy milk for years and actually make uh, very good coffees with both of those products. They recently, early this year, signed a deal with Oatly where um, they actually doubled the number of outlets that Oatly will be in in America by doing this deal. And it's a huge partnership. Oatly's pretty cool. It all looks good and they can start to uh, take consumers with them and tackle those impacts and get towards their targets of being uh, net good. So in marketing, uh, for a very long time, we talked about the five Bs and the traditional five Bs are things like product, place, price and so forth. So I've, I've used uh, words beginning with P to describe some of the new tactics you can use if you want to put this into action and bring it actually into your marketing. Um, so the first thing is have a really clear purpose and purpose is another, it was probably the word of the year last year, I've got a whole section of my book, 
the CEO of Unilever says that they will literally dispose of any brand that doesn't have a big bigger purpose than washing your clothes or uh, or your hair. Um, and all of their brands have adopted purposes. Um, a recent example, um, Selfridges has come out and it's reopening with a really, you know, staggering uh, change, you know, giving this as like a temple of expensive luxury fashion and, and shopping. And they've, they've come out with this huge statement on the front of the shop, let's change the way they, we shop. And then inside, they've got all kinds of uh, charming and actually quite radical initiatives. So renting clothes rather than selling them, uh, refills and eco cosmetics repair stations. So you can get your clothes repaired rather than buying new ones and so forth. So they're really doing a lot and they've got behind this agenda. And the managing director, when she launched this, just said, look, we've got to shift. People are expecting a change after COVID and this is our big change and we're going with this. And I, I applaud them for doing so. So that's purpose. Uh, secondly, is more than parity. So it used to be if you wanted to buy green, you'd sort of have to accept slightly shoddy products. Um, you know, maybe the, some of the original fair trade coffee uh, could taste a bit rough and you felt virtuous for drinking it. Uh, the original recycled bin bags uh, tended to split if you weren't careful and so forth, but you felt you were doing the right thing. That's no good when we want to shift um, entire markets to new things. So I was on a panel recently with both of these brands, uh, the Impossible, one of the founders of Impossible Burger who make plant-based fake meat and also Bulb Energy, which is one of the fastest growing companies in Britain and only do renewable energy. And both of them made the point, we win by actually providing a, a product which is as good or better than others, as well as our greenness. So go beyond parity. And they, they were saying it's on us. We, we have to just be excellent as well as selling um, uh, the benefits of sustainability to support that. Another key thing uh, I think to explore in any marketing, but particularly in sustainable marketing, you saw that in the brew dog example, in the selfish example, is, is look for participation. So Lego, who's a client I've worked with over the years, um, they are really working hard on the fact that their product is basically made from plastic that's made from oil and they will fix that. They put up a billion euros to research new materials and they'll get there, but it's taking them a while because they've never found anything quite as rigid yet. Um, but what they can do right now, and they launched last year, um, is every loft in the world has some Lego in it uh, that's had a child in the house, or very many of them do. And we've got plenty of Lego to keep us going for years and years. So they've launched a scheme to start collecting it in. Similarly, Innocent, who were a client of mine back in the, uh, back in the day, uh, they came up with this scheme, uh, getting customers to knit willy hats to raise money together for... Um, uh, fuel poverty and for older people. So this is what I mean about participation. And it's so much more uh, satisfying and engaging than just putting up a poster saying we're good. Actually doing something, doing something with people really moves things on. Uh, an extension of that build from partnership. So two really successful examples. Adidas originally partnered with Parley just to make a few demonstration shoes to show off at a big business event. Last year, they sold 11 million pairs of them. It's one of the most successful uh, launches in the sports trainers markets uh, for decades. And they've also now worked with Parlay to really rethink all of their supply chain and their circular economy principles and apply them. Similarly, a huge scheme called Loop, which um, do go and check it out, but it's kind of like the milkman for groceries and lots of different companies have come on board. And the thing with sustainability is you often can't crack it on your own. You often need to partner with others to um, create a big enough proposition to really shift things. So here, Loop is uh, collecting tins for you know everybody from um, hagen dazs to nivea and so forth and then refill it washing them and refilling them it's a really nice consumer experience they're very nice packaging and also it really shifts uh, packaging waste in a couple of years where we've been really concerned about plastics uh, and finally uh, be pointed i always say that um too much marketing is sort of like an all-over massage and what you really want it to be is like acupuncture just find things in the moment every week, every month, something you can say in social media, something that you can do, something that you can try, just find these pinpoints and, and work out what you can do. So Brompton, which is a case study, which I cover extensively in my book, I'm a huge fan of uh, what Brompton have done to rev revolutionize, as they put it, urban mobility. But I just looked online to look at, you know, what are they saying on their website now, uh, this month? And they're, they're talking about as, you know, as lockdown was easing, this was last month, let's leave trans public transport to those that need it. And it's just very timely and very pointed as opposed to, you know, 
for all your folding bike needs. Um, so find really pointed things and keep trying stuff. I think you don't need one big campaign. You just need lots of little attempts and get stuff going. So I feel like uh, I have comfortably used up my speaking slot. Um, I'm checking the time. I'm not too far over. So I have left some uh, space for uh, the awards, which you're mainly here for. And now if I get my thing here, I can hand back to April uh, to take you on with the event. Or Toby. <laughs> back to uh, back to me. Right, John, uh, we've got a few questions. Uh, uh, anonymous one here, but uh, I, I thought one that's really, really appropriate. What inspires you, John? How did you get into green marketing in the first place? Well, I think the real question is how I got into marketing. I was a um, quite hippie student. I discovered sort of Eastern philosophy in my teens. I had long hair. I was, you know, doing yoga back when it wasn't trendy, when most of the people in the yoga class were suburban mums. And I volunteered at a charity. And then I, I figured that whilst I really uh, loved working for, a, you know, a quite radical charity, trying to... Um, help people in the developing world um, I really didn't have the skills so I thought I'd go to an ad agency and get some skills I, I volunteered in the press office and I just didn't want to lick envelopes the rest of my life so and I kind of got stuck I mean advertising was fascinating and I actually had a lot of clients I worked with the disasters emergency committee uh, Amnesty International and others so I got to continue those sort of passions but over time I realized that actually influencing you know, like back in the 90s when I was working with Volkswagen, being that having the background that I have, being a slight corporate hippie and being able to go to a meeting with the guys from Germany and say, I really think we should get into car sharing. And I've been looking at these schemes and there's this new thing called City Car Club. So I sort of am slightly amazed that I stuck around in marketing so long because um, in some ways I was due to go back to a, an NGO and, and, and I've always volunteered and done things um, with causes and campaigns that I want. But I, I guess I've, I've found it um, in a way, even though perhaps I would sleep better at night every night if I'd only done um, sort of work for a tree planting NGO, I think the ability to influence companies small and large and get them to shift is really what's going to shift this agenda. And I think we all have a role, role to play. Activism from within, it's got to be, a, got to be the way forward, hasn't it? I love, uh, I love that you're a corporate hippie. Right, here's another one. Uh, and this is something I think that we all we all struggle with to a greater or lesser extent. But what's the best approach to talking openly about our green business efforts whilst acknowledging that we aren't perfect? Uh, transparency is a word a lot of people use. Um, it is difficult because there is a conflict between people in um, marketing always want to put the best foot forward and show the best, you know, show the best of what they are and sustainability is really about being ruthlessly honest and saying look come with us we're working on it you know we know we've been using plastic everybody did and here's our roadmap to try and transition out of that and do something different like these new loot tins and so forth but you know come with us on the journey so i think a bit of humility um not too much um you know preaching from the pulpit but actually doing things with people and, and also being really, really transparent, like H&M, who are like properly Swedish about this, publish not only the audits of their factories, but the names and addresses of the people in those factories. Uh, Veja, who make uh, very nice sustainable uh, sneakers from things like Wild Rubber, have incredible levels of disclosure on their website. They publish the founders' salaries and they, they got a quote from a Chinese factory to show how much cheaper they could make things if they cut corners and didn't try so hard to do the right thing. So being really, really transparent and honest. And um, I would say don't hold back because so many people worry about the risks of greenwash. And, you know, we've got 10 years to, uh, less than 10 years now to get on top of a lot of this stuff. So try stuff. People will forgive you if your heart's in the right place and you're quite sincere and open. All right, last one. Quick, quick question. Who inspires you, John? Uh, this morning's answer, David Attenborough and Prince William, the, the scheme they announced today, uh, fantastic. And I love those public figures who've, uh, like David, who've devoted a lifetime to educating the public on this. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic individual. Um, so I've taken loads from that, John. Fantastic, uh, fantastic speech. 
Thank you hugely. Thank you. Um, regenerative, regenerative is going to feature much more highly in my lexicon now, and I will be reconsidering my uh, my beer drinking choices. <laughs> right, uh, we will move on. Uh, April, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. Hopefully, you can see my video. Okay. Um, Thank you so much uh, to John for that really um, enlightening talk. I've, I've been really enjoying your book. I've read your, your previous one from 2007 as well. So it's really inspiring for somebody that's not a marketing professional as well um, as I, you know the work businesses that I'm constantly working with. Definitely, I'm always encouraging people to really tell their story and engage people because as you say, John, we don't have the time really to to worry about um, our imperfection, um, but being really transparent about that imperfection and talking about the journey that we're all on, I think is really, really important. So um, thank you, John, and thank you, Toby, as well, for introducing the event. Um, I'm April. I am the national lead for Investors in the Environment. Um, I lead our teams as well as working directly with many of our, our businesses as well. And I have the fantastic honor today to announce a number of our awardees as well as um, talk through um, you know, this amazing 10 year anniversary that we have this year. So I is a service um, that is offered by our environmental charity, PECT. Um, we've been going now for 10 years, but we came together 10 years ago, identifying a gap essentially in the market. There's so many businesses in the UK that um, weren't on an environmental journey at all. They didn't have the in-house knowledge. They didn't have a methodology or any idea of really where to get started. So uh, we pulled together best practice uh, in environmental management and we produced uh, the IIE criteria, which are flexible enough for any business to adopt, to get started, but robust enough for a business to actually um, improve year on year. And that is an important uh, thing to, to note that our businesses, when they're members, they're on, audited on an annual basis and they're uh, encouraged as well to, to improve. But it's Part of that journey is about benchmarking and setting targets and going on, you know, beyond the minimum of legal compliance to uh, looking at the wider opportunities for engaging people and uh, telling those sustainability stories as well as demonstrating some social impact. Um, this last year, we've had a really phenomenal year, um, aside from what's happened uh, in 2020 with regard to the pandemic. Um, our members have achieved some really phenomenal uh, savings between our audit year, uh, starting from April 2019 to April 2020. Um, and we've, our members have achieved over almost 14,000 tons of uh, greenhouse gas uh, reductions uh, for the resources that you use. So the, the method that we use is each year, our members uh, measure and monitor specific resources, and many of those will impact on their carbon footprint. Um, so by aggregating that data and pulling it together, we can really understand as a charitable organization how we'll, we are fulfilling our charitable objectives. And it's just phenomenal that we have this uh, incredible lever for change that uh, businesses are engaging with and they're actually using it to drive forward really impactful sustainability action. Um, so the, that almost 14,000 tons of carbon that was saved is the equivalent to almost um, generating almost, uh, you know, 3,000 um, empowering 3,000 UK houses uh, or taking almost uh, 3,500 cars off the road for a year. Um, so since that audit period as well, there've been additional savings of, of over 3,000 tons, uh, which completely excludes data uh, from lockdown. Um, and I just think, you know, the UK government has said there's over 4 million businesses that were registered in the UK in 2019. If only 1% of those businesses or to adopt a really impactful methodology for, for making improvements and tracking their carbon footprint for one, you know, what a fantastic achievement that that could be. So one of the big drivers for our team um, is how we measure you know, our impact, but we also encourage businesses clearly to look at how they measure you know, their impact too. So there's various things that they do. So from you know, our start from running various campaigns and doing simple swaps, which are really important. We use our this methodology of the IIE criteria to really um, 
get organizations to make impactful changes on the areas where they have kind of the greatest potential for impact and really adapting and adopting action plans that will help them not only cut their costs, but you know, cut their, their environmental footprint as well. Um, and then each year they have to set targets uh, for annual improvement. So this is significant because that takes a, a local action, you know, the local action that you're doing in your organization and it can have a global impact or feed into, uh, you know, an incredible global impact with, you know, reducing the worst of the climate crisis and boosting biodiversity as well. And today we're clearly here to celebrate some incredible businesses that have actually achieved uh, their accreditation, but there are many more, as you can see here, that are actively working towards uh, the core criteria of investors in the environment. So it's important to note that whilst these organizations haven't yet uh, achieved their accreditation, they are doing some really excellent work and it's worth calling that out. But today we're going to recognize those who've actually achieved it. So I hope you'll uh, join me in celebrating their achievements. You can access the IIE Awards brochure on our website and find out a bit more about the winners as well as uh, find out some more and engaging content for some of the topics that we've covered throughout the week. My great honor to talk you through um, or announce really the winners of our, our bronze awards this year. So for bronze level accreditation, organizations are really setting a baseline and uh, putting some important actions in place with regard to reducing their impact. So they've taken their first steps toward environmental management. They've started mon monitoring things like their basic utilities, getting um, their energy, a greater understanding of their energy use, uh, looking at their water consumption plus an additional resource. They've identified and are starting to work at targets for reduction. They've implemented a recycling or a waste reduction uh, uh, system. And they've begun to, to communicate that progress internally and hopefully externally as well. Um, and you know, after today's talk, hopefully more of them will feel a bit more confident in doing so. So I'm really pleased to announce, I'm just gonna turn my um, view off for a moment. Pleased to announce that our, our awardees for bronze are BGL Group, Stockton Riverside College, Old Hall Vets, and the British Veterinary Association. Now for silver, these, these businesses have achieved all of the basic bronze criteria plus travel plans and they've got great analysis in place. They've demonstrated reductions across at least five different resources and they've taken on at least two environmental projects of significance. Many businesses at this level are also actively looking at making improvements to their procurement process as well. So congratulations goes to Greatwell Homes, Crick Software, Gateshead Council, Alliance Leisure, JCS Fish, and Brocklesby. Further congratulations goes to Longhurst Group, City of Lincoln Council, Hegarty Solicitors, Perrow, and Durham County Council. And now I'm gonna announce the winners of the Green Award um, 2020. So this accreditation level means that you've reached uh, a certain point um, of monitoring. You are monitoring at least six different resources. Uh, many of our businesses are, are looking at uh, even more than that. Uh, you've achieved targets, minimum of 2% improvement across almost all of your resources. And you've got great engagement across your business. You've been audited and I've identified further areas to improve. So these businesses include Addo Food Group, part of uh, Riverside Bakery, part of Addo Food Group, Athene Communications, Buckle Solicitors, Budget Paper Supplies, and Skanska Peterborough Highways. Uh, one more is BCS Consulting. I'd also like to congratulate Cambridge and Counties Bank, Peterborough Regional College, Cross Keys Homes, Davies Veterinary Specialists, Daventry District Council, and Evergrip. Congratulations to Green Energy Switch, Hull City Council, Hull College Group, Hunt and Coombe Solicitors, and Greenheart Clean. I'd like to further congratulate Plus Wipes, Kingstown Works Limited, the University of Northampton, Roy Thorne Solicitors, and the GBN. 
Congratulations goes to WF Glazing, Rocket Mill, Ecology Building Society, Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust, and Northumbria NHS, sorry, Northumbria Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. And finally, I'd like to congratulate Peterborough City Council, Perkins Engines, Northampton General Hospital, PPS Print, and LIDA. Okay, so before we move on to my announcing the final two special award winners, I would like to acknowledge um, that 2020 has been an incredible year of uh, youth engagement with many youth demonstrations and protests around uh, the climate crisis. So we invited a youth speaker um, to share his thoughts and his passion with us and why it's important to engage with, um, you know, taking steps toward reducing your environmental impact and, and staying motivated. So I'd like to introduce Freddie Holt. Um, hello, everyone. As, um, thank you, April, for introducing me. As said before, I'm Freddie Holt, and I actually go to school in Peterborough. I study at TDA Sixth Form, and I'm also an active member on the Peterborough Youth Council. Now, this is exciting for me. I haven't done something of quite this scale before, and it's but I'm here to talk about why people my age are actively campaigning, actively getting involved in the environment and trying to make Peterborough and the surrounding areas a much greener place. I'm sure, so I'm sure many of you have seen students marching up and down the streets, people, um, people dressed in green, demanding action on the climate crisis, but perhaps their individuals perhaps are part of um, Extinction Rebellion. And I want to talk about why we are doing this, what we've done. Um, and as a member of the youth and as an individual, what have I done? What have I tried to contribute to the environment? What have I tried to do in my local communities? Um, let's hope this works. Can we move on to the next? There we go. Um, so as Peter Youth Council, we have already met with head teachers. We've already met with people that we can communicate with on a one-to-one -one basis of how we are going to improve schools. We've got a whole sub team just to improve Peterborough and work with organizations such as Neen Park Trust and PECT to try make Peterborough itself a greener place and try get the youth, um, not just in our team, but uh, people I talk to, the schools more aware and more involved in what's actually being done to make Peterborough a greener place. Um, next slide, please. Um, and because we are a youth team, the easiest place for us to access and be available to actually discuss these sort of things is our schools. So as an individual at my school, we've already made the entirety of the catering team and the catering department eco-friendly. We've got locally resourced food, we've got everything is recyclable from our cutlery to our packaging um, and obviously with coronavirus things might have been slowed down because there was a lot planned for the summer but we are in the process of making an entire green team just to try get more students involved more students passionate in the school about the environment and one big thing that's happening this year and one big thing that will be one of my duties is to try get a um, try to get the automatic lights within the school, trying to get more energy efficient bulbs um, and try just get the green area around the school to be more utilized, maybe have eco lessons in the um, primary school, things like that, which would really affect how students and how parents and how faculty will actually see the environment, how see the school being involved. Next slide, please. So what are we doing? Um, as I said earlier, you've seen people marching up and down, you've seen people um, getting involved. And I wanted to talk about how I got my passion, how I got my, um, what inspired me to do this and what inspired so many other people to do this. And it was one specific person. I remember in my primary school, I used to have a teacher called Miss Ward. And we used to have eco lessons twice a week and where we'd go out and we'd help my primary school's environment, help 
do some planting. All the food in our cafeteria were grown on the school premises. All the vegetables, all the fruit were grown on the school premises. We would do weeding. We'd learn about the different wildlife in our area. And it would be such a useful thing for us to learn. And I didn't realize at the time how um, rare it was, how uncommon it was. Um, and it was so unique and I'm we are passionate about it because we're living we're, we, we're hoping to live on till 2070 we're hoping to live on to fulfill our dream goals our dream universities our dream jobs myself I want to become a solicitor I want to become a lawyer and I want to be able to use my skills in that profession to help the environment I want to be able to do what I want to do as a job, but also involve my passion for improving the world around me. And I imagine not having to clear out like masses of trees for infrastructure, but incorporating it into the build, incorporating it into our daily lives. I know in certain places around the world, they have thing called eco cities where they don't remove the trees, they build around them. They don't remove the wildlife, they don't remove anything, they build around it, they incorporate it into their cities. And I know in the wider scheme of things, it might seem like a pipe dream, but that's what we're all doing. That's why we're all here. We are trying to make it so it's not a pipe dream. We're trying to make it so everyone can see that we are actively campaigning for this, we're act actively doing this, we're actively making the world better. <laughs> And if, if we tried to do this 20, 30 years ago, people would have, they wouldn't have believed it. They wouldn't have believed what we're doing right now. They'd see it as stupid. But we are amidst a climate crisis and this is important. And the more big businesses that see this, the more people will get involved. And I wanted to say thank you. I wanted to say how inspiring it is to see all of these businesses doing their part you are allowing me, you're allowing my generation to have the dreams of grandeur, to have the dreams of living in a sustainable environment, to have the dreams of actually be able to go to work and not have to worry about the world crumbling around us. Because of this, you are laying the foundation in which my generation needs to lead. We are a green youth. You've seen Greta, Fun Greta Thunberg. We are, um, our youth is so passionate about these about this cause, about the environment. And we are noticing this, I'm noticing this, seeing everybody here today is such a awe-inspiring thing. And you're all here for a reason. And I'm privileged to be able to speak with you today. I am so proud to be able to in the same call as John for such, because I did not expect to be able to do this. I did not be able to expect to have this voice. And we can go so much further. The more corporations, the more businesses that get involved, the more youth that get involved, the more everybody gets involved, the more the world will get better. The more we are contributing to this grand design, this big scheme to make it a sustainable life that we are living. And I am here on behalf of my school. I'm here on behalf of the Peter Youth Council, but I'm also here on behalf of the youth. And I'm so proud to say I'm a citizen of this city. I'm so proud to be in this call because the things we are doing is amazing. So I want to say thank you to everybody who has contributed, everybody in this call and everybody who is winning awards. And I shall now pass back over to April. Okay, thank you so much, Freddie. Um, it's, it's great to do uh, something that you love as a job, but also uh, feel like what you're doing um, does good for the wider world as well. And I, I think a lot of our businesses that are on this webinar um, can, can relate to that. Uh, and I also, I can relate to, you know, having had my inspiration from a really fantastic teacher that really showed me the, the importance of, of the natural world and why we should protect it. So thank you so much for coming on this call and um, for having being that. a part of this. It's, it's great to hear from you. Okay. so. Um, it's on to me now to do a little bit of a recap. So all week we've had, this is the seventh of, of an incredible awards program uh, since Monday. Um, we've had six other webinars around key themes. So I'm gonna do a bit of a, a recap of who has won so far. 
for each of our, our themes uh, in honor of, of IIE's 10th anniversary. So on Monday, we announced best carbon reduction for 2020 went to Northumbria Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. Peterborough Regional College received the award for best water reduction 2020. And during our waste webinar, we awarded Northampton General Hospital the best waste reduction 2020 category. Sustainable transport champion for 2020 went to LIDA during our tra transport webinar. And the winner for the natural environment champion went to Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. Finally, the biggest social impact award winner for 2020 was Cross Keys Homes. Now I'm absolutely delighted uh, to announce, this, this leaves us with two final awards outside of the resource themes. Many thanks goes to this category sponsor, Hunt and Coombs for their support to make this event possible and for this award. For this award, judges were looking for how the business influenced and changed behaviors within their organization, as well as practices of other organizations, projects they might have undertaken to change a process or a practice or ways of working and successful environmental campaigns too. The winner needed to show how they have changed behaviors of other people or organizations to inspire change beyond their direct business activities. This award goes to both an organization as well as an individual. And I'm delighted to announce that the winners are Davies Veterinary Specialist and their sustainability lead, Ellie West. Judges felt that Davies had undertaken a lot of far reaching activities as a whole practice team, helping to drive sustainability within their sector and influencing others. They also commended Ellie West for her sustainability passion and leadership, which was an evidence from the impressive array of events, podcasts, and even scholarly articles that Ellie has written and contributed to the interests of furthering the sustainability agenda. One has only to speak with Ellie for a few minutes on sustainability to feel inspired, motivated, and capable of making change oneself. Additional commendations for this category went also to BGL Group and TGBN. Judges were impressed by BGL's range of activities to support culture change, and they were impressed by TGBN as a micro business, demonstrating outstanding influence in improving the uptake of UK recycling certificates. So congratulations to Davies Veterinary Specialist and also those who received commendation. Finally, I'm delighted to announce our overall Outstanding Achiever Award for 2020. This business is recognized for having made a big impact on resource reduction, staff engagement, carbon, foot re carbon footprint reduction, and social impact, to name just a few. I'm delighted to present this award to the following business that not only achieved over 90% on their IIE audit, but they slashed their energy use, they cut their water consumption, they increased recycling, they reduced paper, and they achieved an annual 32% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for this audit period. And the award goes to Cambridge and Counties Bank. The judges said that their large capital investment in refurbishing their premises to be more eco-friendly with big initiatives to also engage staff on reducing their carbon impact at work, at home, and through how they travel was very impressive. They changed how their building is, is heated, so they've stopped using fossil fuels for heating, and they've had huge and prolonged social projects that are consistently run throughout the year for schools, the arts, and others really a very well-rounded effort with loads of staff engagement happening too. Congratulations to Cambridge and Counties Bank. And now I will hand off to Toby to um, give our closing remarks. Thank you, April. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is just to uh, note that today is Clean Air Day uh, and we want to show that we all have a part to play to keep our air clean. During the COVID lockdown, we experienced cleaner air and saw massive shifts to low population behaviour. For goodness sake, let's keep the momentum up. So if you haven't done so already, take a look at and download the IIE Awards Brochure 2020 from the website or the newsletter that will be going out to all event attendees tomorrow. 
uh, is filled with articles full of tips and ideas to become greener organisations, including a campaign calendar for 2021 to keep up the staff engagement on environmental issues. And of course, if your business isn't an IIE member, uh, visit our website, sign up and start on your journey towards achieving accreditation. Next slide, please. I just wanted to uh, wrap up by saying uh, a big thank you to everyone who's been involved in the uh, in the event events of this week, uh, but the event this afternoon. Uh, you know, where we've got people like uh, like John and Freddie able to talk with the passion, uh, the uh, uh, the knowledge um, uh, the, in, in such inspirational ways, uh, you know that makes makes me hopeful for the for the future. Uh, our sponsors, uh, you've been fantastic in supporting this uh, uh, this event. Uh, it wouldn't have happened without you, uh, and we're we're extremely grateful for you uh, for you making it possible. Uh, IIE members and attendees. Uh, I want to thank you for you know what you've already done for the environment, but what you're going to do for the environment in the uh, in the future. Uh, we need you to be advocates. Uh, we need you to be advocates for IIE because we believe that IIE is a good mechanism to uh, Im improve our impact on the environment, um, and we need you to be advocates for the environment. We need all of you to be you know championing the cause. I know we all believe passionately in. But I want to leave you with a, uh, with a quote, um, uh, Robert Swan, who some of you may know, uh, and I just think that this is absolutely spot on. The greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. We all have a role to play, whether that's as individuals in the consumer choices we're making, whether it's as businesses, whether it's as advocates, uh, or whether it's as part of our communities, please, all of you, um, you know, lever that influence uh, as much as you can. Thank you all very much and good afternoon.